the founder of C Junction, and C Junction is the place you see is a public venue where people can come and read about Southeast Asia, and we also have events. At the moment, we have a photo exhibition downstairs, which is about cross-border health on the Thai-Myanmar border, about malaria, tuberculosis, mother and child health, and how people move across border to get health care provision. So please do go after uh, this to see the exhibition on the first floor. And then today we have the honor to have here Jeffrey, who is an old friend, actually, and very knowledgeable about the region, right? Sometimes I think he's a spy. <laughs> but that is, uh, but I think he has worked in various countries in region, originally from Singapore, but today we'll be talking about his seminal book. It's quite impressive. Unfortunately, it's sold out. No more copies of this book. But it's about the role of Thai, the Thai Chinese community in Thailand historically, and of course also about what is happening today, that the position of China is particularly uh, strategic for this region. So he will be talking, he has written this book with his wife, but today he will be talking by himself. So brief, Jeff. Oh, how are you? Hello? Oh, oh it's too yeah. loud. Okay. Hello? Uh, uh, well, thank you, uh, Rosalia, for inviting me uh, the, this evening. I should start by making two disclaimers. One is that I'm not a Singapore diplomat. And if you announce that I'm a Singapore diplomat, it will make the Singapore Embassy upset. <laughs> That's one. Second thing is that Rosalia said I'm a spy. <laughs> well, let me say I'm not a spy, but nobody will believe me. <laughs> well, uh, before I, I start, I would like to announce that there are some luminaries and named families with us tonight. And the one that I know very well is Tan Sri Krishna. Tan Sri Krishna is the father of Malay movies. He became famous by making the movie Hang Tua, a black and white movie. And he is the one who discovered P. Ramli, Siput Sarawak, Maria Menado, you know, the Malay world, Malay movie idols of my mother's generation. That tree looks very in robust health, but you won't believe it, he's 97 years old. And he's a buddy of uh, Tun Mahathir, but Mahathir is only 93. Huh? Now, I have a little story about this longevity with that I want to share. Many years ago, I had dinner with Tan Sri in Bangkok. And whilst we were having dinner, a phone call came through from Singapore, conveying the breaking news that Lee Kuan Yew passed away. So I lowered my phone and I uh, spoke with Tan Sri. He was eating. And I said, Tan Sri, Lee Kuan Yew passed away. And Tan Sri stopped eating and he put his fork and spoon on the table. Then he raised his hand and said, I beat him! <laughs> At that time, Lee Kuan Yew was only 92. Yeah? And today, his buddy, Mahathir, uh, has been called the oldest Prime Minister in the world. Now, uh, another small point about Tan Sri. Tan Sri is also a hero of the anti-colonial struggle during the war time. He joined the Indian National Army and became a captain 
in the uh, uh, base camp, Singapore base camp of the Indian National Army. Captain, right? Yeah, that's it. Now, another uh, interesting personage I want to just mention is my good friend, Kun Subhatra. Kun Subhatra is a Thai Muslim. She is very well known in the Muslim community. She is the niece of Haji Yusuf Rawa. Haji Yusuf Rawa was the founder of the Pass Party of Malaysia. And Haji Yusuf Rawa is the only Malaysian politician to have beaten Mahathir in an election. <laughs> and today her cousin Mujahid is in the new uh, Mahathir uh, cabinet. So, so much for breaking the ice. Let me uh, come to the top. Uh, I wrote this book with my wife. Yeah. Now, when I embarked on this book, I began to make a startling discovery that underneath this veneer of thai and Thai culture lies an entrenched and deep-seated Chinese presence. It struck me that this is a secret of the Thai body politic. The famous public intellectual, Saw Sivarak, or Sula Sivaraksa, as he is known internationally, uh, <coughs> alluded to this shadowy secret. He said, Thailand is the only country where a Chinese could become king. It is also the country where he loses his Chinese identity. Sulak has thrown out a kingly example of a Chinese in Thailand. Before that, a previous author, Kenneth Lenton, who wrote a book titled The Chinese in Thailand, published in 1942, uh, left a characteristic description of a commoner Chinese merchant from the 1930s. Lenton wrote or said, uh, and I quote, a prominent Chinese merchant whose face was unmistakably Chinese, whose father was Chinese, though his mother was Thai, became offended when he was called Jack. <laughs> now, to call a Chinese Jack in Thailand is like calling a black man bigger uh, in America. He added that, and this was in spite of the fact that he lived in a Chinese-style shop house in Chinatown, like Chongra. His shop signs were all in Chinese. He himself spoke two Chinese dialects. He keeps his accounts in Chinese and sends all his sons to Chinese school. Yet, this very same man also spoke the Thai language perfectly. Regards himself as Thai, not Chinese. Suppose the 1932 Nationalist Revolution and makes donations to the Thai military and armed forces. Now, Lenden's description also resonates with my own personal experience during my early days in Thailand. 30 years ago, I took my friend, my Thai friend, to a Chinese mom and pop store. When we entered the shop, the Chinese old lady addressed my friend in Thai to dialect. To my surprise, she got upset. 
turned around and said, I'm not Chinese. <laughs> what? Out of the shop. Now, to me, all this was very surprising. Uh, almost a culture shock. I grew up in Singapore, where people are unabashed about being Chinese. In Malaysia, in Indonesia, uh, people don't get upset when you call them Chinese. Yeah? The former late president of Indonesia, who is a friend of Rosalia, was proud to proclaim his Chinese ancestry. However, this experience is quite uncommon in Thailand. This resentment, this resentment at being singled out as Chinese feeds into undercurrents of anti-Chinese sentiment with explosive repercussions on the history of early Thai nationalism. Let me explain. Now, the growth of anti-Chinese sentiment in Thailand went hand in hand with the policy to promote Chinese integration. Following the Burmese wars during the 18th century, which totally obliterated the kingdom of Alitia, wiped it off the map, the population of the Chao Phraya Basin became depleted. The new Thunbury Kingdom under Jim Taksin, whom I just mentioned, uh, <coughs> began to promote Chinese immigration in order to repopulate the land. This pro-immigration policy was continued during the Bangkok period. The Chakri dynasty forged an alliance with the Chinese community to operate revenue tax farms in opium, gambling, and alcohol, create a rice cash crop export economy, and build railways throughout the kingdom. Science 3,200 kilometers of railway was built by Chinese labor towards the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Chinese labor, Chinese capital, Chinese entrepreneurial skills became indispensable to Kim Chulabongkong's modernization projects. At the same time, this policy of aggressively promoting Chinese immigration generated explosive contradictions across modern science, interlocking political, social, and economic frameworks at the turn of the century. By the late 19th century, the British advisors to the kingdom, like Warrington Smith and David Campbell, became alarmed at the large Chinese presence they saw. They predicted that at this rate, at this rate, surely, the Chinese minority will displace the Thai as the dominant ethnic group in the kingdom. They warned, unless Chinese immigration was stopped, the Thai race would cease to exist as we know it. These alarmist views reflected the racial bigotry that was prevalent in the Western colonial circles of the late 19th century. At that time, racism was rampant. Racist doctrines like the yellow peril swept across the Western world. Many Western governments enacted racist and racially exclusive laws to keep up Chinese immigration, including the government of the US. Our Western advisors recommended that for their own good, the Zionists should do the same. However, be that as it may, somehow, 
anti-Chinese sentiment did not, did not spread to mainstream Siamese public opinion, at least not immediately. Rather, they remain <laughs> marginalized and contained within Western expatriate circles for a long time. But in the end, in the long run, it did. Anti-Chinese sentiment began to spread and influence the nascent Siamese nationalist, nationalist movement and fed into the ideology of Thai nationalism, which took on an anti-Chinese character. Anti-Chinese sentiment was embodied in the writings of King Rama VI, the father of Thai nationalism. The most famous is his uh, little book called The Jews of the East. <laughs> the, the young king compared his Chinese subjects in Siam to the Jews in Europe in a manner which smacks of Western anti-Semitism. Now, uh, in many ways, the rise of Thai nationalism was a reaction to the ethnic preponderance and growing alienation of Siam's Chinese community. Four factors contributed to this development. One is the Chinese General Strike of 1910. The second important factor is the rise of Chinese nationalism in Siam. Third is the 1911 revolution in China. And last, the most important, is the emigration of women. <laughs> okay, the Chinese general strike. In 1910, the Chinese launched a general strike to protest the increase of the Chinese tax by King Chulalongkorn. This Chinese strike shut down the whole of Bangkok for three days. The strike became a wake-up call to the ruling Siamese elite. It demonstrated how the Chinese exercised total control over Thailand's economy and the wage labor force. The Chinese could shut down Bangkok in a day. The Thais began to see the Chinese in a different light. Oh, thanks. As a threat to the Siamese dominated social order for the first time. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this never happened before. In the past, there was no serious problem among the two races. The Chinese would assimilate into Thai society, into the Thai social hierarchy, at, at all levels, from top to bottom. And the Thais, in return, was hospitable to the Chinese. There was no Chinese problem to speak of. But after the general strike, Siamese social circles began to raise the issue of the Chinese problem. Now, the subsequent attack on the Chinese embodied in the Jews of the East was a retaliation. It was a warning by the young king to his defiant Chinese subjects in Siam that, hey, the Thai want to be sovereign in their own land. The next important factor 
was the rise of Chinese nationalism in Siam. The rise of Chinese nationalism in Siam was accompanied by the arrival of Chinese schools, Chinese newspapers, Chinese associations, and the growing presence of Chinese political activists, revolutionaries, and agitators in Bangkok. Bangkok became the hub of Chinese nationalistic politics throughout the Nanya as conservative pro-Manchu boys competed and clashed with Republicans and revolutionaries for the allegiance of Siam's overseas Chinese. Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the father of Chinese nationalism, came to Bangkok three times to gather support for his revolutionary Republican Party in Tom and Kui. The Thai began to see that for the first time, the Chinese was beginning to set up an overarching sense of Chinese identity, transcending dialect, regional, and speech group identities. This was new. This never happened before. In the past, the Chinaman never called himself a Chinese. Rather, he always thought of himself as a Taiju, Hokkien, Hakka, Cantonese, or Shanghainese. He never thought of himself as Chinese. The emergence of an overarching sense of Chinese national identity occurred only at the turn of the century, around 1910. Now, the development of a similar, comparable, overarching sense of Thai identity came later, in the 1920s and the 1930s. The next important factor is the 1911 revolution in China. The 1911 revolution, or the Xinhai revolution, as it was called in China, was greeted with euphoria in Bangkok's Chinatown. The whole of science Chinese community rejoiced and celebrated the overthrow of the Manchu dynasty in China. The 1911 revolution created a strong Chinese consciousness and created a sense of distinctness about being Chinese. Again, all of these are identity strengthening and reinforcing factors further contributed to the growing isolation of Siam's Chinese community. The last and by far the most important factor was the emigration of women. One of the liberating effects of the 1911 revolution was the emigration of women. Before the 20th century, before 1911, Chinese women don't emigrate. Now, the arrival of Chinese women in Siam suddenly meant now Chinese men no longer married Siamese women or Thai women. Whereas in the past, the Chinese men would marry a Thai woman, because Chinese women don't emigrate. He then moved into a Thai home. In other words, he set up a Thai family. The children of the Thai family became Lu Ji, Thai word meaning child of Chinese father and Siamese mother. But now, the Chinese man married a Chinese woman. 
and establish a Chinese home. With the Chinese home came the Chinese child. So now this Chinese child began to replace the Lu Ji of before. Furthermore, this Chinese child no longer spoke Thai. No. Naturally, he spoke Chinese. And now his educational orientation became directed by both his Chinese parents towards China instead of Siam. So the uh, emigration of women suddenly put a stop to that age-old historical precedent, to that ongoing process of Chinese assimilation into Thai society. The Thais began to see the Chinese as aliens in their midst, living in separate, unassimilable Chinese communities whose loyalty to the host country became suspect. So, the stage was set for the clash of nationalisms. Chinese nationalism on one hand, Thai nationalism on the other. This clash came to a head with the rise of the People's Party following the revolution of 1932 and the subsequent Japanese military invasion of China later in the very same decade, that's right, 1937. <laughs> now, Japanese military aggression against China, the ancestral homeland of Thailand's Chinese, galvanized the Chinese community and resulted in a tremendous outpouring of support for China's war of resistance against Japan. The uh, Chinese community, spearheaded by the Taiji Association, the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, and charismatic leaders like Hia Kuang Yim and E Chu Liang, bought Chongqing government war bonds, the KMT bond, and sent large sums of money back to support China's war effort against Japan. The Communist Party, Communist groups, and Chinese secret societies, the Yi, together organized a boycott of Japanese goods in Bangkok and targeted Japanese businesses throughout Thailand. But when Prime Minister people allied with Japan, suddenly the host government and its Chinese minority found themselves facing off in opposite camps. As Sino-Japanese tensions increased, all Chinese schools and Chinese newspapers were closed by the people's government, and many Chinese leaders were arrested. With the outbreak of the Pacific War, of the Second World War, Japan established a military presence in Thailand under threat of torture and terrible punishment by the Japanese secret police, the Kampatai. The Chinese community was cowed and forced to collaborate and cease all its anti-Japanese activities. Those who refused went underground and later joined the wartime anti-Japanese uh, resistance. Let me fast forward and skip the wartime. At the end of the war, Japan was defeated. Surprising <laughs> at the time. China emerged as a great power 
and join the newly formed United Nations, the UN. Thailand established diplomatic relations with China for the first time. And again, Chinese immigration was resumed. In the early post-war, large numbers of Chinese immigrants came over to escape poverty and war-torn conditions in China. Uh, let me conclude. Now to conclude, what is truly remarkable and amazing about all this is that despite all these ups and downs, the clash of nationalisms, and all those tensions between the host government and its Chinese minority, Thailand never, never adopted the racial exclusion uh, policies advocated, advocated by those early British advisors like Warrington Smith. Thailand always, always maintained her assimilationist policy and never, never shut the door to Chinese immigration except for that short, short window under the people government. Ironically, it was not the Thais at all. It was the Chinese themselves who did that. You see, following the Chinese Civil War of 1949, communist armies led by Mao Zedong swept to victory in Beijing. The new communist government of the People's Republic of China, the PRC, declared an isolationist policy and forbade Chinese citizens from going abroad. Reminiscent of the early Ming and Qing dynasty. Consequently, the Chinese community here suddenly found itself cut off from its ancestral homeland for the first time, unable to renew its political, cultural, economic, communal, and ideological contact with the Chinese homeland, the Chinese community began to shed its Chinese identity. And gradually, slowly over time, eventually assimilated completely to its newfound Thai identity. Now, when this book first appeared in uh, Bangkok, among the first people to see it was a very famous Thai journalist. He was the president of the Journalist Association. He saw uh, the cover of the book with the title, A History of the Thai Chinese. And he turned to me and he said, Hey, Jeffrey, I'm afraid this book is all wrong. There's no such thing as Thai Chinese. We are Thai. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> let me stop there. <laughs> and thank you very much for your kind attention. I, I hope that was okay. Thank you very much. So I do. Yes, so please, I open the floor. This is just part of the book. As you can see, the book has many more pages than what he has been saying. So please, any common questions to Jeffrey related to what he has been saying? Either one, I take two or three questions first. Two, okay, please. Three, okay, please. Congratulate. I congratulate you on this hard successful in the book that we all see. Now, just one thing as a writer yourself and a common social, I suppose, huh? uh, would you be able to single out or one of the major or it could be number of factors which are uh, very, uh, what is it, critical in contributing factors for the Chinese, Sino Chinese? Ethnic Chinese to lead or to influence 
uh, economically, um, financially, uh, politically, in this Thai society. Thank you. Okay, great. Let's go to this. Oh, I would be able no, to no, 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 Wait, wait. Three, uh, that's ten. Okay. Hi. Hello. I understand you want us to find you, so you just drop us the last. <laughs> the last uh, comment without further explanation. Which one? The one that we are only Thai. We are not, there is no such what a thing. What are talking uh, about the Thai Chinese? We are Thai. Um, so I would like you to elaborate on that a bit. Not that I will not buy your book. I think that's an interesting point for me because it speaks for much more about today. Um, uh, the other question is, uh, uh, could you maybe mention it is in your book, the time when uh, there was a fight against communism here, and uh, Chinese schools were closed down, uh, Chinese names were not allowed to continue, people have to change to Thai names, you know, there's that wave. And the last one, I think this would be very interesting for me, is how do you explain this? Somewhere I said that uh, our current royal family is Chinese. I'm not talking about King Pak Sin, but I'm talking about the, the forefather who took over King Pak Sin. And that there's two ceremonies, Chinese rituals, that they perform every year. And this dual action without uh, making it official or public. It's public, but it's not official in Chinese. Okay, please. Next question. That was fascinating. Um, I would like to ask about the um, ones that PRC began with the isolation um, mentality. Um, was there any, any um, continuation from that part of, of connection to the um, the motherland from the Kuomintang, from the now city in, in Taiwan. I remember that last year when I was vis visiting Chiang Rai and uh, Mesa Bang um, I was, I saw a lot of evidence, not only reason, but also a little bit um, from, from my understanding yes. around that time. So if you can show a little bit more on that. Shall I answer first? I have no choice. <coughs> Maybe the last one. <laughs> it's okay, you can take it down. Huh? It's okay, I'm going to just... I think you can hear it. Huh? Is it any of that? Like that? Like that? It's okay. It's okay. Maybe I, I remember Supatra's uh, question. Uh, she's basically asking, why do the Chinese behave like Chinese? <laughs> the Chinese uh, like to do business, and they do it very, very, very well. No? Well, there are many answers to that, but a general one. You see, the Chinese have been migrating to uh, our region for thousands of years. And among the countries in this region, uh, the, probably the most important is, is Thailand. Uh, there is a certain affinity of the Chinese for the Thais because of religion, similar religion and so on. But the important thing, I think, is the, uh, what do you call, commonality of interest. Because uh, uh, the history uh, of Ayutthaya, and subsequently the history of Tonbui, and the, the history of the Chakri dynasty, is basically the history of the alliance between the monarchy and the Chinese. 
during the time of Ayutthaya, before the time of free trade, uh, the uh, revenue for the royal family came from tributary trade, largely the China trade. Uh, the Chinese China trade was the lifeline of uh, all the countries in the region under the Chinese tributary system, which Sarasin Virapur has described as a trading system, basically. But actually, it is more than a trading system. It is also the precursor to a modern collective security system at that time. But anyway, uh, before we get into that, yeah, the China trade was the lifeline of the Malay world, of Vietnam, of Japan, of Burma, of, of, uh, of Thailand. Now, to trade with China, you need uh, resource persons, huh? expertise. The, the, the Thai royal family had no expertise. So it only makes sense that they turn to their Chinese community. Like as I said, yeah, the alliance between the Chakri and the Chinese uh, community to operate revenue tax farms in opium, gambling, and alcohol. Uh, previous to that, uh, the Chinese was used to run the uh, tributary trading system. All the Chinese ships were run, all the, the royal ships of the royal monopoly trade was run by Chinese. Yeah? Uh, could I? Is that okay? Now, regarding... They are also collecting tax, and they were doing the jobs that uh, my people were not allowed to do, because historically it's the feudal system where my people have to only work on the land, and they are not allowed to be free uh, to do this media uh, work. Because they would break, if they are used to do those things, they would break away from being the serf to the land. I, I think that's another you're, you're right. I, I don't know. You see, the, uh, the tax farm huh, came later, see? In the beginning, during Ayutthaya time, uh, the royal family ran <coughs> uh, a trade monopoly like King Narai, you know? Uh, Thailand was at the height of its trading uh, capability under King Narai during Ayutthaya. There are hundreds of ships. They sent it out, not only to China, but uh, to, to India, to Indonesian waters, to the Indian Ocean, and so on. So, uh, the royal family, the monarchy, uh, source of revenue is monopoly of trade. But when the Westerners came here, right, they wanted to bring into uh, the trading system. They wanted to compete with the uh, local uh, traders. So they used gunboat diplomacy to force local rulers Indonesian Rajas, Thai kings, uh, Cambodians, yeah, to dismantle their royal trading monopolies. But that is the source of revenue for the royal family. So if you dismantle uh, the royal trading monopoly, uh, how would Siam you know, earn its revenue and its income? So. After the Opium War, yeah, you see the international drug trade has its roots going back to the 18th, 19th, 19th century, where the, the Westerners they wanted to buy uh, goods from Asia, but don't want to pay in gold and silver, so they <coughs> created opium. They grew, they 
began to cultivate opium in India and then take opium to uh, addict the local population to, uh, to the drug. So the opium trade became uh, an important substitute, substitute for the British, the Dutch, and the Dutch so that they don't have to use valuable, scarce silver and gold to pay for Chinese silk, Chinese porcelain, Chinese sea, and so forth. Yeah? So the, uh, what you said about the, uh, the tax farms came later. At first, it was the royal monopoly trade. But because the Western powers forbid the uh, royal family to oper continue operating the royal monopoly trade, yeah, they are forced uh, to go into drug production. So they set up opium monopolies. And the British said, fine, you know, as long as you yeah, uh, open up uh, your, your door and you allow free trade for all Western uh, ships uh, uh, to come and, 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 and participate, that's all right. Drugs is okay. Drugs is better than raw trading monopoly. Regarding yeah, the 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 uh, royal family, yeah, what when I was uh, researching the book, I was reading King Mongkut. It was King Mongkut who said that uh, King Rama, the first mother, was a beautiful daughter of a Chinese merchant. Yeah, good spot up then then vouch for that. And since then, up till the time of King Chulalongkorn, it has been a, a hallowed practice for wealthy Chinese merchants to donate their daughters to the royal harem. So there are, you know, a lot of Chinese infusions into the royal family. And Ariel, what was what, your, your, your question? Huh? About communist time, right? That was also a question about the communist time. How right, Chinese right. communities in Thailand were suppressed in another period when Thailand was fighting the communism. And they, they forced Chinese people to change their name. They're not allowed to carry Chinese family name. Uh, Chinese schools were closed down and many of Chinese papers were controlled. You see, there are many... During the time when Thailand was collaborating with the U.S. to fight against communism. Uh, which would you like me to focus on? Which period? <laughs> I, I think in the 70s. 1960. 1960? 60? 60? 60? 60? 60? 60? 60? 60? That's very interesting. <laughs> period. I'll tell you a story. Uh, before this book came out, eh, uh, the same publisher came out with another book. It's called The Americans in Thailand. And this book is called The Chinese in Thailand. No? So, whilst I was uh, writing this book, uh, I had dinner with my, my editor from EDM, this publisher. And he told me a very interesting story. He told me about uh, uh, the last people uh, period. And at the end of that period, general survey, yeah? Because the government uh, was an alliance between the Soy Rachaku group, you know, Pim, Pao, uh, Pibun and, and Sade. Yeah? Together they were the triumvirate that formed the uh, military government of that time. Now, towards the end of that period, Sade went on an extended trip to Washington, D.C. Uh, the American and Thailand book had many American contributors, and many of them were close to uh, U.S. Uh, 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 government agencies and so forth. So 
so he said that, you know, Sabi went to uh, Washington, D.C., and he hospitalized himself, and he was there for a long time. And he said, guess what? Every morning without fail, who comes to see him? Tanat uh, Koman. Tanat <laughs> Koman, who later became foreign minister. Tanat yeah? Koman at the time was the uh, State Department asset. So Tanat Koman came and had extensive, extensive discussions with Sari. The result of all that is that when he came back, he made the coup in 1957 to throw out, to throw out the Soi Rajakru group. Yeah. Uh, and install one of the most uh, feared uh, military dictatorships Thailand ever had. This is very interesting because when uh, Saw Sibala met with this king, the new king, uh, uh, they, they shared a joke almost. The king asked Sula, what do you think of my prime minister? And Sula <laughs> thought that this is, must be a trick question. How do you answer this? <laughs> Huh? Yeah, so, so I said, well, I'm sorry, but I'm an old man and I've seen many military dictators and the most dreadful of them is Sabe Tanara, but he's very clever. You know? He's competent, he's clever, I mean, he's terrible, but I'm afraid you're prime minister, <laughs> you know, he's not very smart, huh? <laughs> and then, so I said, Ajahn, then what did the king say? And he said, well, the king laughed. Well, sorry, set up a very tough uh, military dictatorship. <clears throat> and at that time, they uh, mounted an offensive against the uh, CBT. And they used the, the, hope, the remnants of the Kuomintang army to you know, fight for them against the CPT. It's a long story, but there are many aspects to it. But if there's something specific, you ask me, I'll, I'll try to answer that. But otherwise, it's, it's yeah. very broad. And, uh, I think I'm talking more about the sentiment against the Chinese or Chinese identity. And that time of uh, fighting communism and associating Chinese and Chinese communities to be promoting communism, so therefore they're trying to suppress that part. And I think that affected that affects still on us today as Thai Chinese in some ways. That people don't want to be called Chinese, part of it because it has that association. Uh, and it also diluted the identity of Chinese because you cannot carry your own family name anymore. You have to change your family name to Thai name. And in the past, the Chinese Thai used to be called Se, Lo, Se, Lu, and so many other Chinese names, but not anymore. I think this has made something to the impact of, of Chinese identities in Thailand. It's true, but this, this thing uh, is complicated now. And it's difficult to uh, 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 to discuss in, in, in some ways because yes, there is anti-Chinese sentiment, okay, but that's superficial. Is there really anti-Chinese sentiment? You know, today in Thailand, there are no more hundred percent Thai. You spread any Thai on the street, and the chances are that underneath is Chinese. Yeah? You know, but it, it did away the Chinese nationalist identity. That's what I'm trying to say. It's something that they want to be more Thai Chinese for. Something is lost. Well, let's put it this way. The most rapid anti-Chinese are Chinese. Yeah? Oh. Now, you have to see in terms of generational ways. Yeah. The early Chinese, they came here, they married Thai, they uh, established a Thai family, and they had 
Thai children, and they became Thai, you know? Yeah? Now, uh, after 1911, it changed because women began to emigrate. Now, when women began to emigrate, Chinese men started marrying Chinese women. So, you have, you, you have the rise of a new social formation, like in Indonesia, we call it China Toto. <laughs> you know? These are the new generation Chinese. And the people who hate this new generation Chinese groups are the Chinese themselves. They are the older generation Chinese. They are not so much Thai. It is the Chinese themselves. Now, the bulk of the People's Party of 1932 are Chinese, you see? I think, yeah. I think that also I'm listening to this anti, not just the Chinese, you see, the generally doesn't receive much attention from historians or scholars. Migration of women it just has been ignored traditionally. So I was just wondering, since this is this has made such a change to the community here, the Chinese community, yeah. can you say a little bit more about what are, if you like, super briefly the crucial pull factors? Why have these women migrated here? What was it what attracted them to Thailand? What were they leave in China? Why would they leave in China? How, what was the, the, that transition, which is obviously quite big for all migrants. Just, if you could just say something briefly about this particular yeah. area. Thank you. you know, as I said, uh, the Chinese have been migrating for thousands of years. But for most of that time, before 1911, it was Chinese males who came, you see? And they assimilated into Thai society. The women that came. And uh, when they married a uh, Thai woman and established a Thai family, uh, if they have a daughter, the daughter is raised as Thai and she would dress in Jokabe in the Thai uh, costume. But if, the, if they have a son, then they will send the son back to China to be educated in Chinese. Because it's very important for the lifeline of the Chinese community to be able to participate in the China trade. Now, if you are not linguistically competent and you don't have the connections with the, uh, with the homeland, then you are not going to be much use. As you can see, many uh, uh, old Thai families who became uh, uh, acculturated, yeah, they became very, very Thai, and then they lose their edge, you know, uh, their competitiveness, and then they fall by the wayside. What is the Pisangu family? They can't even speak Chinese. So, uh, 
for Chinese family, it's very important if they have a son, they will send the son back to be educated in China so that they can build, build the, the contacts and return. You know? And then they will be effective uh, uh, trading, trading uh, participants. But 1911 is, well, first, uh, you have the overthrow of the Manchu dynasty. Sun Yat-sen himself was a Freemason, you know, he was a Christian, right? So the 1911 revolution uh, has many liberating uh, inputs. And it was in this atmosphere, combined with the breakdown of social order in China and war and so forth, that uh, forced this wave of migration uh, to come up, not only to Thailand, but to Indonesia, to Malaysia, to everywhere. Nothing specifically on the I'm, I'm really interested in No, I think what else in Indonesia was start the movement started at the same time. Initially it was all men. And only later is the change that also the typical Chinese so family. Not only Thailand. The Chinese merchant would come here to trade and establish their companies and their home city here. But Chinese women don't emigrate, so they have Thai wives, yeah, and they have uh, Thai children, you see. But they always make sure they send their son back, otherwise they won't be competitive, they would lose love. She was wondering why women start to migrate. I think it's because of the 1911 revolution. The revolution was a very liberating event. This was actually relates to the question of uh, the lady behind me on uh, that time, um, the Chinese identity, uh, why that connection with the mainland was cut down because of the because of the PRC. They maintain it uh, with Taipei, with uh, some. Yes, the, the, the link with Taipei is very interesting. Because during the civil war that I mentioned, yeah, not all units of the Kuomintang could join Chiang Kai-shek yeah, in the passage to Taiwan. And a lot of Kuomintang units, especially in Yunnan, were cut off. Yeah. Uh, they could not join the main force to, uh, uh, to sail to Taiwan. So they fled the communist uh, advance by coming across the border into Burma. And they settled at the Burmese border and in Chiang Mai. And the leader of the uh, Kuomintang army was General Li Ming. You know? And at that time, you know, Chiang Kai-shek fled. He took all the treasures to Taiwan. But uh, uh, Taiwan was still a fledgling state, you know. It had not yet industrialized. So uh, they asked for assistance from Taiwan, Taipei, to support the Kuomintang army, the 93rd army in China. It was not forthcoming. Chiang Kai-shek basically told them, you look after yourself. So they had no other choice but to turn to, turn to drug trading. But remember, the date is very important. It's the 50s and 60s. By that time, the Vietnam War was going on. And uh, whilst uh, the Americans were fighting the Vietnam War, Ho Chi Minh was able to supply the Viet Cong by the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So this prompted the Americans to invade uh, Cambodia. And there was a secret war which was conducted in Cambodia for five years, right? Unknown to the American public. So if the war is secret, it means that it didn't exist, right? So how do you go to Congress for congressional appropriations to support a war which is not supposed to exist, right? So the Americans turned to General Van Pao, uh, the leader of the, the war, and ask them to grow opium as much and as fast as possible. Yeah? And then 
the CIA helped to market this uh, heroin internationally. So after the uh, uh, opium war, the second wave of the Gulf trade was in the wake of the Vietnam War. Yeah? The international drug trade, the modern international drug trade was set up by CIA consent. Now, I'm not uh, saying this on my own. Let me quote Professor Alfred McCoy. His first book was called The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia. And out of that book came the movie starring Mel Gibson and America. Yeah, yeah. So, it, but this thing is all documented. You know, it's, it, it, it has been declassified already. Yeah? So, the drug trade is very, very important. And the KMT, you know, uh, in order to survive, because they have no money coming to Taiwan, so they joined Lo Sing Han. You know, Lo Sing Han was a, a general in the Kuomintang army who, uh, who worked with General Stilwell in the last days, days of the war. Yeah. Lo Sing, general Stilwell wanted, he, he was quite progressive. He wanted to hand over, the Kuomintang to hand over to, uh, to Ho Chi Minh. But somehow, it didn't happen because at the end of the war, uh, Lord Mountbatten, you know, came to help the, his his friends, the other colonial powers, the Dutch and the French, you know, to come back and reclaim their colonies. Now something happened over there, and Lo Sing Han, you know, this besides, you know, the uh, uh, insistence of General Stilwell, did not hand over power to Ho Chi Minh, but instead. It, to the French. Interesting factor of the last round, if there is, okay, one and two, and then we are going, and three, okay. Please introduce yourself. Hi, thank you for the interesting talk. And uh, previously, I used to do research on Chinese diasporas overseas as well. And what I did notice um, when I interviewed people from, I guess, Western countries, yes. um, they were very, in terms of uh, their identity, they were very you know, comfortable with saying that they were you know, Chinese American, Chinese French, right. Chinese Dutch, whereas with people in Southeast Asia, they were very adamant in saying, like, no, I'm Singaporean, I'm Thai, but I'm ethically Chinese. So. Um, I think it's interesting. I think one aspect of it is definitely the local identity politics because yeah. a lot of Western countries, you know, they treat minorities still like outsiders and they don't really try as much to assimilate, I guess. Not to the degree that Thailand has with the whole la last name and that kind of thing. You know, I think, don't take that seriously. Then take my case. Huh? Yeah, yeah, but... Um, I, I, I'm yes, quite old, I'm not as old as Tan Sri, but old enough to experience some very funny experiences. I was born not a Singaporean. I was born a British subject in the Crown Colony of Singapore, okay? Then, when I was a child, Lee Kuan Yew won the general elections in 1959, right? So, in his electoral victory uh, announcement, he spoke, he addressed all Singaporeans, all, all the people on the island, and he said, right, from now on, you guys, you are no longer British subjects, right? You are Singaporean. Huh? Think Singaporean, you are no longer British subject. Okay, fine. So, we said, okay, we are Singaporean, and we, we have a new national anthem, we say, Mari kita, <laughs> and so on, okay? Now, a few years later, in 1963, Singapore joined Malaysia. Lee Kuan Yew again came on, on radio and said, right, now you are no longer Singaporean, right? No, you are Malaysian, okay? So, just remember that, you are Malaysian. Don't ever say you're Singaporean anymore. And we have to sing the Malaysian national anthem. <laughs> now, 
1965, they kicked us out of M M Malaysia, right? Lee Kuan Yew came on TV by the time there's TV, you know, and he cried and cried, and he said, oh, it's so sad, but now, you're no longer Malaysians, right? You are Singaporean. So how can you take that seriously? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to see the end of 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 the end I asked some of the people, you know, in Southeast Asia, like, why do you not want to identify with Chinese? And one of their theories was because, you know, from an economics perspective, maybe more migrants of Chinese descendants to Southeast Asia are from a more economically disadvantaged background. Maybe they came during the famines, whereas the ones that were able to go to the West, although they weren't rich, they had the means to go to the West. Yeah. So from an economic perspective, what do you think um, was the case with, you know, Thai okay. Chinese Thai? Wait, no please. <laughs> okay, one minute. Bye. <coughs> Last round. Wait. Okay, please. I just wondered what, the, uh, what you think will happen to the future Chinese immigrants in Thailand. Um, the ones who are coming now, the um, there's large waves of integration. I know the government is, is doing certain things limited, but there were exemptions in the 70s and 80s. Which, which government? This government. Ah. Thai government oh. for Chinese oh. migrants now. Oh. There were exemptions in the 70s and 80s regarding Taiwanese, Chinese coming to Thailand, gave them citizenship quite easily. Um, I was wondering what you think of the, uh, given their experience the post in the 90s and 2000s, these families coming out to Thailand, how easily they will assimilate into Thai society, and how much do you think they will really want to be Thai? You mean Thailand? Thailand the, the Chinese uh, immigrants now and the next 20 years. Okay. Wait, wait. That's what I'm There are different reasons uh, over different time. You see, uh, in the early days, yeah, the China trade was not, was dominated by the Malay world. It was the Indonesian sailors and their ships which took the trade to China, because at that time, China had not developed seafaring. And one of the reasons why we became Indianized. Uh, during that early, early period, uh, Hunan, Angkor, Champa, and so on, is because the Indians uh, developed seafaring earlier. The Chinese developed seafaring much later. Yeah? So the early uh, China trade was carried by Indonesians to China. But after the Song Dynasty, China began to develop seafaring. And then uh, the, Ch the China trade was no longer dependent upon Austronesian uh, sailors and traders because Chinese merchants and Chinese ships began carrying the trade to Indonesia, to the South China Sea, to, to Sahel. Uh, so uh, a Chinese diaspora began to, to form. Now, after the uh, uh, the Ming Dynasty kicked out the UN, the Mongols, yeah? uh, they were very concerned about the security of the South China Sea. So, in the dispute between Parameswara and Siam, yeah, because Parameswara. Uh, establish the Kingdom of Malacca after he killed the Sultan of Tomase, who was a vassal of China. Uh, and the Thai king, Ayutthaya at that time, wanted to take Repsol 
against Parameswara. Parameswara astutely sent a tribute ship to the to Nanjing, to the Ning Kok, and asked for protection and royal investiture. So Parameswara was given royal investiture yeah, as the legitimate recognized king of Malacca, and uh, Chen He's naval fleet was sent to protect Malacca against uh, Siam. Yeah? So, uh, you know, at, at different times uh, it changed. During the Ming, the, uh, in order to curry favor with the rulers of the South China Sea, uh, the Chinese must offer them something yeah? to make them staunch allies of China. And everybody wanted the China trade because that's the lifeline of all the uh, uh, port cities of, uh, of the South China Sea. So to help the uh, uh, Indonesian Malay rulers, the Ming Dynasty issued a decree to forbid Chinese from going out to sea on pain of death. Like uh, in the case of Palembang, there was a one of the biggest over, uh, Chinese communities in Palembang, uh, after Emperor Hong Wu came to power, they were ordered to return to China. You know, they refused. So uh, the Ming court then sent Admiral Chen He to attack Palembang, burn it to the ground, and kill 5,000 Chinese. This is in the record. You can read uh, the history of this period by John uh, John Bixi. Yeah? So uh, the Ming Dynasty uh, was willing you know, to curb its own people and to suppress its own people yeah, in favor of foreign merchants in order to win their allegiance for them to join in the Chinese tributary system. Yes, you have a question about the difference between Chinese in Southeast Asia that come from poor areas and the one in the West that come from rich areas and therefore are more proud of their heritage. Sure. Well, you know, yeah, some, some of the final distinctions are difficult to discuss. But broadly speaking, yeah, uh, our ancestors emigrated at a time when China was in decline after the uh, attack by, uh, during the Opium War, the unequal treaties of Nanjing, the Boxer uh, War of 1896, the Sino-Japanese War. So there was a breakdown of social order in China. I mean, their roots were falling over their head. So they migrated for survival, you know, to seek uh, a, a more possible livelihood away from China. And these were our ancestors who came here. They, they came here out of poverty. Everywhere, not only from the countryside, but from the cities as well. And of almost every ethnic or dialect group, they came out. So now the, la the last question was about what about the more recent migration of Chinese now to Thailand? How is the Thai government dealing with that? Recent migration? I would say, well, very recent. Yeah, I, they come up here, but that's for trading, you know? it's for business. It's not really migration like our ancestors. Our ancestors came out for survival. These Chinese, they came down the barges of the Mekong River, not for survival. You know, they advertise for Thai wives to get married in order to use their, uh, their wives' uh, access to trading opportunities. That's different, yeah? Uh, Chinese don't emigrate. Why should they emigrate? China is now the largest economy in the world. Uh, it is, has become the greatest creditor nation. Yeah? It, it just helped Trump to save off the, the government shutdown. Xi Jinping last week agreed to buy lots of food from China yeah? to you know, help uh, Trump to 
kick down the coal can for the down the road. And you know, we'll look at that later. So the uh, the US corporate debt has been refinanced by China, right? Now uh, here most of the tourists are Chinese, right? They came out all over the world. They are not migrating, you know. The, the impression that you get from Hong Kong is all skewed up. You know, the Chinese in China don't think that China is so bad. Because if they thought the situation in China is so bad, if they could get out, they won't go back. But millions of Chinese tourists go out, you know, as tourists, and they all go back, right? Now, look at it. Now, so the, the, the propaganda of the uh, situation in Hong Kong doesn't really apply. If you compare it to, say, uh, the Iron Curtain, huh? everybody is trying to get across the Berlin Wall. They'll never come back. They never look back. The Chinese could freely come out. They could. Yeah? Nobody is talking about unskilled labor that moved to Thailand or to Singapore. There are many from mainland China who recently now. So what about that migration? There are in Shanghai, there are South Sumatra, there are not only go up back and down. So I think it's minimal. It's not, not much. Because if you think about it, yeah? today, China is the world's greatest production power. Yeah? Since the four organizations, China has built itself into the greatest production power. The Chinese can produce anything. I mean, Huawei is, a, is an example. So, of course, there are some pockets uh, of uh, disadvantaged people and they may migrate, but these are small. Yeah? Because by and by, Trump is trying to get uh, the American companies to leave China to go back and restart factories in, in America. I mean, the Chinese are doing well. So it's going to move to China soon. <laughs> leave Thailand for China. OK, I think this is an interesting discussion and much more uh, could be said. We can continue the discussion with coffee and tea. Yeah, but she had the last question, right? What no, she, she already answered. It was about the privileged or not privileged Chinese that moved to the West. You answered already. So I think you <laughs> answered before. So OK, so I think we can continue the discussion. Uh, outside, please, on your way out, give a donation for C Junction to continue this kind of activity. Activities. And see you, the next one is going to be on philanthropy, about the role of international foundation in Southeast Asia. I will be a speaker there. So don't miss the 24th of uh, October. Come again and see the exhibition. Thank you very much and applause.